Dearest Mama and Papa, these words give notice of a great endeavour I must undertake forthwith at the behest of Empress Matilda of Anjou. Regrettably, I will be absent from these shores for two years or perhaps more as I cross borders numerous and unknown, making my way to the east, to lands and cultures far beyond our experience. By Hecate, fear not for me. I am in perfect health, and my heart soars with joy at being chosen by the Empress, for whom I hold the greatest respect and admiration. That just makes you want to get on a boat, doesn't it? Do make sure you don't forget your radio, though, as we've got four more episodes of The Clash of the Cousins coming up, including today's, which focuses on the Cynthia Reusmarijn Doulard, Duchess of Chilton. And if you thought Alice Amor's recruitment drive from last week was tough, then what Reusmarijn went through for hers takes the biscuit. But enough from me. We have an expert on this particular quest in the studio this week. Please welcome Dr. Victoria Flood, historical author and consultant to many wonderful series and esteemed publications. Well, I'm honoured to be here, Dr. Linton. I listened to the first two episodes and was impressed by the depth of your programme. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Flood. How kind of you to say so. So... You've recently published a new book on Ross Marine titled An Odyssey of Fire. And I have to say this made for excellent source material for this episode. Thank you. Now, could you tell us about how the book came to be, your inspiration and your process? The peculiar thing is, I didn't set out with the intention of writing the book as is. I generally publish on trade customs between nation states focusing most often on the Middle Ages, and was researching for a monograph on such customs in the 12th century when I came across Rosmarine's story. As I read more about her, you might say I became obsessed, and the book grew out of that quite naturally. It was the swiftest thing I've written in some time. My goodness, and something of a runaway success with pre-orders in the tens of thousands, I might add. I am touched by the level of engagement. Now, there was a real arc to her experience, wasn't there? Consider that youthful exuberance in her letter. She was in her mid-twenties, after all. It still does intrigue me, in fact, that Maud chose her for something as challenging and as crucial to the First Highcath War as going in search of Neridii. Maud had many courtiers in her time, but Rosmarine was more than just that. They were close friends. Okay, so that presumably also means that she knew all about Lucy Bolingbroke, the only Neridia in England that Maud could call upon. She was well aware of Maud's growing distrust of Lucy and conscious of her need to strengthen her position for the war ahead. My dearest Rousmeraine, I pray to Hecate that you complete your mission with care and skill, for it will be arduous. May you also take inspiration from the many lands that await you and find cause to sate your desires, all the while never deviating from our goal. Know that I trust you as no other at this most precarious time. Go in safety and return in triumph. Now, Dr. Flood, I'd just like to zoom in on one aspect of that letter. Maud talks of Rosmarine sating desires. To put it simply, Ross Moraine was a free spirit and felt stifled in the environment of Maud's court, something which her diaries confirm she expressed to Maud in confidence. Now, if I'm honest, when I think back to where I was at 25, years into my PhD with a good while still to go, well, I could have used a holiday myself. (laughs) This was no holiday. Ross Marine was about to discover the first nugget of that particular truth as she crossed through Vienna in mid-1137. Ill fortune has descended upon me, mere months into my journey, for this grand city through which I fare bows to every whim of the accursed persecutors of our temple. 
I have heard their mendacious sermons echoing out of every door, seen their false pardons displayed in every street as if to taunt me with their presence, to make manifest their supremacy. Pray, Hecate, I do not find myself at their mercy. Pray, Hecate, deliver time without these oppressors to darken my path. From what we've just heard, Rosmarin really does seem to understand the church for what they were. That's as may be, but England was no comparison for Vienna, where the diocese of Passau had full and active control and were constantly expanding, engaging in widespread missionary activity and establishing more and more monasteries. Mm, so you were never far from them. No, no, the diocese was the most powerful for miles around. Their word was practically law. No wonder Osmahain wanted out of there. That's the diametric opposite of the kind of England she and Maud were working towards, and scarily close to the way it was actually going at the time. It was a salutary lesson. Quite, quite so. And if I may say, where the Odyssey gets its fire. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. I couldn't resist that one. <laughs> yes, this would have doubtless fueled Rosmarine's imagination. She was well aware of the life the Empress envisaged for High Cathay in England, one sympathetic towards their nature and their craft, where they might be allowed to grow and learn free of persecution. And indeed very much under their control. That too. But, in the light of the church's vitriol, we might say it was justified. True. Yes, true. And quite relevant at this point, as it goes. Because Rosmarine, presently on the trail of the Anatolian Neridia, is about to arrive at Constantinople, where there was more of a high Catholic presence. Specifically the outskirts of Constantinople, where the high Cathay had made camp. And I believe, if I'm correct, that this is also where she meets young Nurai. Yes, indeed. We are outcasts in this place. The people of Constantinople will not feed and water us. They fear you will set their city alight. In directing me here, they made me promise I would not provoke you. But you yourself are a Haikatha. <laughs> they need not know that. They are fools, as if we have any intention of staying here, when there is a city many miles away where our kind live in untroubled peace and serenity. Please enlighten me. I am merely a visitor. The women I accompany hope to be received there, as do I. They say a Haikatha of great power watches over it. I should like to see such a city. You are welcome to join us. Have you a motto among them? My mother perished long ago, as did my father. That city is the last refuge I can hope for, and maybe you will find refuge there too. Please, say you'll come. Perhaps this is where I must go. Now this is a tremendously important milestone in Rosmarin's journey, isn't it? This is where she goes off script, off piste, changes her itinerary and picks up some new travelling companions. I imagine the certainty of meeting one Neridia, that's what I take from a high Cather of great power, as she says, outweighed the search for another. Indeed. And young Nurai was more than just any travelling companion, as we will come to learn. Now this is going to be so interesting for me, given how Rosmarin has now left Europe. And I'm not totally ignorant on this, but I haven't done nearly as much research as you into high Catholic affairs that far afield. In the course of preparing the book, I travelled to Acto, the present-day site of the former city. Their archives have been very well curated and the records kept in good condition. Excellent. I shall defer to you then, Dr. Flood. The city that stood where Aktau now stands was indeed something of a high Catholic oasis, all but cut off from the world outside, which afforded its inhabitants the freedom to live their lives, pursue their interests, and hone their craft in the open, and at a natural and sedate pace. 
The Noridii leading them was named Elmira, by all accounts a formidable woman, whose firm but fair stewardship was reflected in the order and harmony of her city. Extraordinary, because that sounds exactly like the ideal vision of England you gave us earlier. Rosmarine would no doubt have seen the potential here for how things back home could change. Indeed, and the records show that she made it her business to gain an audience with Elmira at her earliest convenience, that she might accompany her back. But if she believed that the Empress's cause alone would be sufficient to turn this woman's head, she was very much mistaken. Elmira had other plans. This place in which I find myself is a bastion of knowledge. Our kind have never been so thoroughly and accurately described as in these pages I read. In the streets of this city I have seen great industry. Three women built a dwelling from stone and timber as I passed, and I had fortune to witness a synther light a brazier at the touch of a hand such that a bevy of young girls might find warmth and shelter amid the shadows of the night, Nure among them. She looks to me as no other has, and I am newly aware it brings me comfort to see her at peace. That is so inspiring, <laughs> and touching too. Ektau was where Rosmarine had her chance to see and feel how a Hycath-led city was run, down to the nuts and bolts. Yes, and from that she would have the tools to take back to England, and Maud, of course. So, this would have been Elmira taking charge. Not just Elmira. Another Noridia, Zoraida, had made her own pilgrimage from Valencia some years before and now served as Elmira's second-in-command. Ah, yes, so Rosmarine had hit on a bit of a bargain. <laughs> Two Noridii for the price of one. But then, well, that's hardly surprising in a place like Actau. Quite. Rosmarine actually spent as many as three months there, observing and absorbing. Mmm, I like that turn of phrase. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, three months is a long time, though even to get knowledge as useful as that. And the clock was ticking for Rosmarine. She couldn't put down roots like Zoraida had. Rosmarine was faced with a complex decision. She had gained a certain respect from Elmira by this time, but also made a shattering discovery. Rosmarine, I did not send for you. I must make one more entreaty to you, if you would consider. I know what you ask of me. Waste not your breath, for my decision stands. England is still at war, Gidalmira, and I am in my Empress's debt. I have already strayed from my mission. With you in my company, that debt shall be repaid eight hundred times over. You will return a wiser woman, Rojmine, and you will be an asset to your Empress. Of that I have no doubt. But know that Aktau demands my full attention, less so your English conflict. Must I reveal your deceit? I beg your pardon? Of how, after months of toil, I encounter one who has the power of Hecate in an instant. No Hakatha can have power without effort. <laughs> she is no Hakatha. I have seen her before. She could not light a fire with a match in her hand. Then she is deceiving you, not I. If you have withheld the full knowledge of our kind from me, then all England will know it. Be careful who you threaten. You have retreated from the world, sealed yourself behind these walls, whilst Hykathai fight for their lives outside. I have seen it. I have lived it. I still live it. We have a right to what power you conceal in the depths of your city. You would not know how to use it responsibly. Then come to England and show us. You are a most able persuader, Rojmine. Before you stands your Niridia. Zoraida will rule in my stead. She is ready. Hecate bless you. Now, before we 
pick up the quest, I have to say, Dr. Flood, that this was a section of your book that really gripped me. I mean, I didn't know you could actually reverse engineer the magic from a high cath relic. Oh, but only by a blood relative. I should say that historians have never verified this claim, and I, for my part, merely made an educated guess. Even so, they'd be setting a very dangerous precedent if they had that power. <laughs> no wonder the rumours have endured. There have been committed believers, too. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Imagine if someone tried to do that with a reckoning hold. I don't blame Elmira for being so cagey. Elmira at least gave Rosmohain the knowledge of how to lead a high Catholic society. True. And I know from my own research that this had been refined in Aktau. It bears mentioning as well that Elmira would return there after her part in the First High Cath War was done. Rosmarine would therefore become the custodian of her knowledge. Absolutely, absolutely. But all that's important at this point for Rosmarine is that she's got what she was sent for. Well, not precisely, but still a Neridia. Except Elmira knew of yet another Neridia, Tanut of Damanhur, who had left her native Egypt to travel westwards. She persuaded Rosmarin that they go in search of her, even though she had no definitive answer as to where Tanut was at that moment in time. Oh my goodness, those are quite some stakes. Even more so, considering that they would have to cross through territory known for its bandits. <laughs> and not the sort of territory you'd take a child like Nure through. My darling, please forgive me. I know this will be a great burden for you. Do you not have what you came for? What more can your Empress demand? All that my Empress and I knew was the power of one Neridia. Now I have seen the might of two. With such might, I should deliver the end of the war and the Church's hold over England. What dreams I had of England. You have thrived in Aktau, more so than I. The lands outside are racked with war and violence. Even England at this time is no place for you. I have known greater hardship than you, with no other for comfort, and still I survive. You need not survive any longer, merely live. Will you take Zoraida also? Will your thirst for power know no bounds? I must not deprive Aktau, and yet you deprive me. Please, my darling, this is hard enough. I shall return for you when all is safe in England, when we have an age of Hecate. But for now, Aktau must be your home. I defy anyone not to get a bit teary listening to that. <laughs> I mean, if I had to leave my daughter behind somewhere, even for her own protection, I, well, I don't really want to think about it. <laughs> it's hard to believe that this is the Rose Marine who is excited to travel the world. Well, I had a similar reaction when I read her diaries for the book. For many months after leaving Aktau, she barely describes the terrain. Nure is mentioned sparingly, but otherwise Rosmarin writes almost obsessively about finding Tanut and recruiting her. Well, I guess two Neridii are better than one. And that, in the end, is the cost of this war. I'm just glad to know that Rosmarine and Elmira found Tanut in the end. Uh, it makes it all somewhat worthwhile. Tanut left few clues. However, Rosmarine and Elmira's perseverance over many months would lead them to meet with the woman they sought in a place very familiar to us all. For this was the settlement of Wudan in Western Africa, which would evolve into al -Maruj. Ah, the promised land. Although we're about seven and a half centuries early, mind. This was, in fact, that moment where I first learned of Rosmarine. 
My research focused on the Trans-Saharan gold trade, mostly working from Abu Abdullah al-Bakri's Book of Roads and Kingdoms, which was written nearly a whole century before Rosmarin and Tanut met. Al-Bakri describes a fledgling town in the desert which had recently made great gains from being a staging post on gold and salt trading routes. Of course, of course it would have been a desert. The land on which al Muruj stands was fertilised by High Catholic magic after the Second High Cath War. But, Dr Flood, despite what you said before, you know, I imagine Rosemarine at least wrote about this town. Oh yes, her diaries were my second source. Very little is written about Wadan from that period. I would ask you if she was successful, but then I already know the answer. Well, Dr Linton, not only could Rosmarine benefit from Elmira's pre-existing connection with Tanut, but she was able to use what she had learned to impress Tanut with her vision for a high Catholic society. I was just thinking, oh, no offence, this is where our work overlaps again. <laughs> None taken. You know, I was thinking what a shame it was that Tanut never ruled a duchy either. She stayed to fight in the war, at least, but then chose to return to Western Africa. I, I suppose, of course, that was her right, but Penzance lost out, in my opinion. Well, it's still counted as a success on Rosmarine's part. Oh, of course. She would definitely have a tale or two to tell Maud when she got back. My dear Rosmarine, what sucker is it that you're here again? Hecate smiles on you. She has tested me greatly. The journey has not been without its trials. We can both call upon powerful memories. England has changed much in your absence. And there is no more a moment of stupor or repose at my court. The activity in these lands is most notable. I have long waited to share this war with you again. I feel the age of Highcath is near. It would appear so. Does it trouble you? You who were so restless before, your manner is somewhat muted. I have served three years in your name, Empress, and have yet to reunite with my family. Forgive my excitement. Be sure as you reflect that your yield of two Neridii is beyond what I had expected of you, and by your effort you will have vindicated the fear, the exhaustion, and the humiliation of these times. Talk about contrast. Rosmarine had gone through so much more than Maud. I presume the events in Maud's life are not for this episode. Yes, we have jumped forward quite a bit to allow for the length of the quest. But now we should focus on Rosmarine and how she kept her promise to Nurai and returned to Aktau some 10 to 15 years after the war. Nothing could keep me from this reunion. Not even Hecate herself. I feared I would not recognize you, my dear. Though you have not lost the fire in your eyes. The years have been difficult, but worth the pain and toil. I now hold office in the Oculus, answering directly to Elmira, and all because of you. But for you, I would be lost in the desert. You nearly were? All is forgiven now. Not in my mind. I have missed you, and hoped we would be together in Chiltern. I cannot abandon my people. They have raised me as no other could in your absence. They have entrusted their lives to me. Of course, I condemned you to this place. That does not mean I wish you to suffer. News of Empress Matilda's victory has reached even here. For which, I offer my congratulations. Hmm. There are some things which even the triumph of the temple cannot assuage. Rosmarine, your duchy needs you, as my city needs me. See it as Hecate's will. Then by Hecate, I must part with you again. How very bittersweet, indeed. There is one addendum I would like to contribute. In fact, I include it as an appendix to the extended edition of my book. It's a diary entry, written by Rosmarine in her last years. 
What complex and convoluted paths we weave, with fear never far behind. In my time I have gained experience and edification. I know the many manipulations of Hecate's power, however impossible. Peace and harmony prevail in Chilton. I have been a mother in you. Oh. Would that I could have introduced them to dear New Rain. Alas, I must carry the wound in my heart alone. But thank Hecate she has found so much in life. Perhaps that is absolution, at least. Ah, oh, I was so transfixed that I almost missed my cue. <laughs> it is something of a deathbed confession. Not least because of the admission Ross Moraine appears to make. Oh, yes. And the bit about Hecate's power. <laughs> so that would explain what became of Actau then. Why it burnt to the ground. An act of defence in the face of grave danger from outside assailants. Now, I know that in the early 16th century, the last Doulard found Rosemarine's diaries, that their curiosity was piqued by the contents and that they gathered a band of people and travelled off somewhere. That's why they're the last Doulard. But couldn't they have just been civil? I mean, how could they expect the High Cathay to give up their knowledge willingly? It just doesn't make sense. Well, they were impatient enough not to care for civility. In response to their haphazard raid, the Hykatha set their own city ablaze. We have evidence that their leader committed suicide by self-immolation in the library. And since nothing survived, we have to conclude that the Oculus did the same to avoid having information extracted from them. So we've lost the secret then, if it even existed. That is the official line, yes, assuming that its final repository was in fact the library. But the devastation was widespread enough. There is, however, at least one rumour that the information survives. That is, of course, if it's even true. And on that tantalising note, we must wrap up this week's edition of The Clash of the Cousins. All that remains is for me to thank my guest, Dr Victoria Flood, and to remind you that her book, Odyssey of Fire, published by Clifton University Press, is available to buy now. Thank you very much. <laughs> and next week's edition will take a different approach. We'll be looking into the story of Aurélie Paquet, Duchess of Hastings. I hope we can count on you tuning in. I most certainly shall. Thank you. Until then, dear listeners, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>